Good evening, everyone, and welcome to SIPSI Victoria's webinar tonight, exploring key aspects of data centre design with Chris Wallace from NACE. Oh, sorry. Now, SIPSI would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Bun Ong Ong Bun Wurrung and the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pays respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here today. Now tonight we're just going to go through some SIBSI announcements and then shortly Chris Wallace from NACE will be presenting, followed by a Q&A at the end. And I strongly encourage everyone to put in your questions in the Q&A function just in the top of the screen and then we'll go through those at the end of Chris's presentation. Uh, the 2023 Young Engineers Awards is open for entries to undergraduates, building services graduates and emerging professionals. The theme of the 2023 competition is centred around embodied carbon, an issue that reaches into all areas of building services engineering. The awards call for the skills and knowledge to better educate the industry and address the challenges of reducing embodied carbon in building services. Entries close 1st of August 2023. You can visit sipsi.org.au for more information on entry criteria and entry inspiration, including tips from our judges. For those who no longer classify as emerging professional, nominating a mentee for one of the three categories is a great boost for your organisation's developing talent. Uh, SIPSI is thrilled to introduce you to some of the speakers joining the 2023 SIPSI ANZ seminar series, Six Minutes to Midnight, Insights and Practical Solutions to Make a Difference in the Built Environment by 2030 and Beyond. Hosted over five weekly sessions online in August and September, this series will provide 10 hours of CPD and include over 20 speakers and panelists. Early bird tickets start from $149 for SIPSI members, and $229 for non-members and provide a $50 saving when purchased prior to 7th of July. All sessions are recorded and can be accessed by delegates until the end of the year. Get program information and see more confirmed speakers at sibsi.org.au. Sip. Don't miss a SIPSI event. Sign up to receive the latest industry news and events from SIPSI ANZ region. Register for your SIPSI regional e-newsletter at sipsi.org.au. SIPSI would like to thank Connexus Recruitment for supporting SIPSI ANZ's annual program of technical seminars and young engineers networking events. Connexus Recruitment are a boutique recruitment consultancy dedicated to the building services design and sustainability sectors. For over a decade, they have cultivated extensive networks and a strong presence through, throughout Australia and New Zealand's design and construction sector, enabling them to connect some of Australia's most recognised design consultancies, contractors and client-side entities with talented individuals from across the globe. Now for what we're all been waiting for. Uh, Chris Wallace is an expert at managing complex engineering and IT projects where reliability and availability is essential. He has a wide experience of data centres, high-rise buildings, fit-outs, green and brownfield sites, and overseeing the APAC Regional Data Centre Business Unit, which is responsible for more than 100 megawatts of hyperscale data centres. As Head of Data Centres and Critical Facilities for MACE, Chris's insight is invaluable in this rapidly evolving space. And now I will hand over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I'll just uh, share my screen if I may. Can everyone see the uh, the PowerPoint? I'll just put it in present mode. Okay, okay thanks, we'll everybody. Do. You can see my screen, yeah, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, thanks everyone for joining me. One of my colleagues in Mason, Australia has uh, uh, kindly volunteered me for this and uh, um, uh, he's uh, last minute not on the call. So I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, bear with me. What I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about data centres in general. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction, then 
walk through electrical, mechanical, fire, IT, security, commissioning, and then a close, just briefly close, um, which is really with the constituent parts of data centers. Um, one thing I find about data centers is it's a uh, there's a, well, there's lots of things that are interesting and complicated, but one of the things that's more more than ever, um, the customers are very very uh, aware of intellectual property. So the whole of the presentation uh, this evening uh, cannot be in very much detail, and it cannot be uh, designated in any shape or form to any one of our customers or clients or anywhere like that. So it's a bit generic. I mean, hopefully it, it's not too generic to be um, you know. A waste of time or of, of no interest but you know bear in mind that um if it's something that's leading edge that what you know one of our customers is doing you know we've got non-disclosure agreement so we can't actually tell you all about it much although we, we might like to the other thing is is i i don't really know um the audience that well i don't know whether people are very expert in data centers or, or, or never been to one um so i've tried to hit some sort of middle ground um so again please bear with me if it's either um, you know, massively too simple for you, or on the other hand, if it's something that there's some element of it you don't understand, uh, which are probably unlikely. Anyway, so I'll, I'll head over and before I do uh, talk about, um, you know, the data center visit, I have to give the obligatory introduction to the company and and Mace. Mace basically are a um, originally UK based, but now global um, um, construction advisory service. They do. Um, uh, project management, cost management. In actual um, Europe, uh, they will actually uh, be your contractor and build things for you. Um, throughout Asia, we are, we've got quite a, a sort of widespread and um, we are offices in the usual you know hotspots like India, Macau, Hong Kong, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Singapore, and uh, in Australia we're in S Sydney and Melbourne. Not really much in uh, ANZ in New Zealand, but we are, have got a presence there. Um, tonight I'm speaking to you from Malaysia, and that's why. Malaysia on the box has got a little bit of a different uh, color. Um, as I say, uh, Mace really have been in Asia for a long time. Um, never really had hit the data center scene uh, in any shape, big size until uh, I was brought in just less than a year ago. And when I was brought in, um, we subsequently won two projects in the Philippines, um, which are underway at the moment, and we're very proud uh, of those. And um, we're we're looking. Um, some more proposals, even as I speak, um, for more projects in the Philippines and elsewhere. Elsewhere, you know, for some of the key customers, our key customers in Europe are largely uh, Microsoft, uh, Meta, and, and there we will actually, build, as I say, build large hyperscale data centers for them. Personally, uh, I've been in Asia since 1997 and um, really did, you know, my background, obviously, uh, I'm a SIBSI member, a professional engineer. Um, my background has really been in the sort of project management side of the business rather than the design side of the business. So this is really by way of observations of the design as I've seen it going through, rather than necessarily a, a, you know, a recipe book as to how you know a, yeah, I would sit down and do a design if I was doing design. Um, and I say the first data center per se that I did was way back in 1999, uh, where we were converting to try and get speed to market, converting a building, uh, factory building in Singapore into a data center. So. Um, been in, involved in and around data centers for, for quite some time, probably 20 odd years now. Um, so I thought uh, it might be worth just starting off with this to sort of talk about what, you know, what are data centers? And I think the top right picture there is a sort of, you know, classical view of what people th might think of as a of, as a data center. And it's that's probably a slightly older model of data center. But essentially, really, you, they're buildings which are obviously interconnected to each other. If they're standing by themselves and not talking to the rest of the world, they're not really much good. Um, and they house rows and rows of a cabinet, you know, computers, servers, uh, storage, um, and of course, routers and switches and everything that makes the whole thing uh, work together. So th these are that the picture on the top right there shows typically what these um, cabinets are look like. And, and in terms of getting an idea as to, you know, how, how many you get, on average, you'll probably get about one per three square meters in, of the building white space area. Uh, and I say that the white space area is the area that typically used to have a raised floor in it. And the raised floor used to be typically white high pressure laminate. So they, they came up with the term white space. Um, and you know, one to three square meters is, is OK. You can do a little bit better, but one is one to three is a good ju jump figure, a rule of thumb. And we'll come back to that later because it's one of these things where you can actually use that sort of building block to actually do quick rough guesstimates on things you know very very quickly just saying well 
if I'm thinking about one per three square meters, you know, then I can go from there. Um, data halls, really, the white space, uh, they're not all the story by any stretch of the imagination. At the back of that, you've got all the cooling and the switch room. Uh, I say cooling in this part of the world. Typically, you know, we still are refrigerating or, or cooling or one way or the other near the data center. Um, uh, elsewhere in the world, obviously, in the Nordics and you know some places in America, they can just blow air through, temperate air through, and that will be sufficient to cool the building. But you know, typically in Asia, find that the you need yeah you know, the, the white space won't be the whole building. It might actually be between forty to sixty percent of the of the overall built space. You might get a little bit more than that, but probably not much more than sixty percent. If you get sixty percent, you're probably doing okay. Um, and then obviously you know we all know, or anyone that's sort of been in around data centers, it realizes that the reliability of the data center is a key concern. Um, and this is basically, I don't know whether people have come across it, but there's an application you can get now called Down Detector. And if you go on Down Detector, it will tell you whether your favorite website is actually working or not working. And it will tell you that, you know, it had a crash for this reason or that reason from this time to that time. So the customers are really, really, um, you know, either banking or you're just cloud computing or, or your travel agents, whatever. Yeah, they're really, uh, they don't want their, their app to be down. So they're very keen on reliability. So this really starts from the kickoff when you're going to look for a site, you want to find a site that's unlikely to cause you any problem. So yeah, the typical things are, it's away from floods, it's away from earthquake zones, obviously, you know, some places in the world, you can't get away from earthquake zones, you know, the Philippines, Taiwan, many other places, Indonesia, you, you know, you've just got to design around it. But in an ideal world, you'd like to be away from earthquake zones. You, you want maybe you want to be for, away from sources of electromagnetic interference like, you know, um, overhead railway tracks or, or um, highways or, you know, uh, in some cases, airports. There's there's a whole rate, a list of things that are sort of things to look out for and, you um, one of the metrics when we look at um, you know, how reliable a data center is, or that there's two basic metrics that the industry use. One is the Uptime uh, Institute, um, uh, Uptime being the opposite of downtime. Um, uh, and the other is uh, the EIA, um, TIA uh, 942. So Uptime Institute uh, a while ago was it started off as really like a, a boys club of data center uh, owners and operators. And it was sharing, you know, um, freely uh, information as to what they could do to make sure that their uh, data center was up and not down uh, and they came up you know quite quickly to some concept they called tiers uh, and then uh, eventually they commercialized it and, and, and monetized it and now uh, the, the word tiers actually is actually um, trademarked and um, so when you look at EIA TIA who have done a very very similar thing they come in early days cooperated with Uptime Institute um they they can't use the term tiers anymore they've got to call it rated so basically in simple i'll use the word tiers for one of a better uh, but but rated is almost the same uh tier one is very very little um you know um resilience and uh, you know very basic bottom you know, very very simple you you very few people i've ever come across that have built a tier one data center Tier two is slightly more. It has a little bit of resilience. Tier three is typically what people will buy uh, and, and most of the market is going for or rated three in the, if they're using TIA 942. Um, and, um, you know, tier four is, is, you know, a much higher level of, um, of of resilience. So basically the the difference between tier three and tier four, and, and you know, you could write a whole lecture or, on this alone is uh, Tier three is what they call concurrently maintainable and concurrently maintainable means that you have typically for major capital plant items rather than terminal equipment, N plus one units where N is the number that you need to do the job and you have another one, a spare one. And the idea is if you have a, ge a generator or a chiller or a UPS unit or whatever the unit is, uh, if you need to actually work on one of them, you can turn one off and you still have N left to work and the building doesn't go down. Whereas uh, fault tolerant means that you uh, have the same N plus one situation as a minimum because it's actually concurrently maintainable. And fault tolerant means that whilst you're in that maintenance situation, if there's a problem, you don't lose the services. So that means you have two N, which is basically means for all the major capital plant in the building, you have two. Uh, you know, if you need one, you have two. If you need four, you have eight. 
Uh, basically, two end systems are almost duplicate systems. It's almost like having two full sets of, uh, of, of buildings. Because of the cost of that, they're not often used. It might be for something like an air traffic control center like that or a government, uh, you know, uh, you know, high security, you know, GCHQ type of environment. But for most of the banks and most of the cloud computing people, most of our customers, they won't want a tier three uh, or, or rated three. Um, just another point on the Uptime Institute and EIA, TIA. Until recently, Uptime, as I say, they very quickly monetized the, the whole concept where it started off as just, you know, industry colleagues helping each other out. Then it got the stage where they'd monetize it. So they would then say, well, we can train you to become a tier specialist and a tier, a qualified tier designer. When you, you know, to do that, you, you know, anyone who's going to design a tier uh, a compliance scheme must use a tier trained person. You know, you know, um, and then you have to have a, a, an audit done by qualified tier um, certified auditors. So it, be, it became very monetized. Um, Whereas EIA TIA 942 was really a standard um, in, in uh, the US and it wasn't monetized so much. However, they've just started to actually um, restrict the people who are now doing audits. So you have to be qualified to do it. There's a, a list of approved auditors now. So there is, they're, they're already starting to get to, into that sort of monetized sort of situation. Um, before, you know, uh, anyone could go and do a, an EIA TIA 942 audit. Um, now, it, that's not the case. Um, the other big issue about data centers, and this is the one that I guess is probably at the heart of why they've become uh, a little bit uh, controversial, shall we say, is the increasing power consumption. And the power consumption is often quoted as a power density, and that's either in watts per square meter or watts per rack. Um, before, you know, it used to be about three kilowatts a rack. You know, uh, that was uh, not a bad density that you, you, you would see. Now, eight to 15 kilowatts per rack is common. Uh, it's not that unusual to see up to 50 kilowatts per rack. So in, in basic, in terms of watts per square meter, you know, it used to be about a thousand watts a square meter. It can be 5,000 or even 16,000 watts per square meter. You have huge huge power loads on these um, data centers. And it's because of these power loads that people like Singapore government, um, recognizing that the data center is now, data centers are now probably consuming 25% of the power in Singapore. But they're saying, you know, right, they're not providing that much employment. They're creating a lot of waste heat. A lot of them in Singapore are using a lot of water as well. Um, so they put a moratorium on building new data centers in Singapore, unless there's some real key defining attribute that makes it different. It's got some whiz bang, green, uh, you know, or low energy, um, you know, background to it that that, they'll, that may make an exception. But for for the average person, you're not going to build a new data center in Singapore very easy, easy at the moment. Um, there was a guy, uh, I think it's Christian um, Baladi, I think his name is from Microsoft. He uh, coined the term power utilization efficiency, a PUE, and this was really uh, um, to try and make the data center business a bit more efficient. And this was really a ratio of the total power used um, in the data center divided by the power used for, uh, for, for, for just driving the computers. So basically, um, if you have a, um, a data center that is a 10 megawatt data center, and that will mean a 10 megawatt of data power, but it's actually using, say, uh, 15 megawatts of power at the incoming um, supply from the grid. That would have a 1.5 uh, PUE. Uh, and typically, the P a PUE of 1.5, you know, most people would not be satisfied with. Um, most people would only be satisfied with a 1.4 or below as a PUE. Um, why I say that is, is a lot of people were trying to get you down below 1.3, maybe into a 1.2. Uh, by using some, you know, um, specialized chillers or something like that. But in many areas that you know we're dealing with now, uh, water supply is not necessarily readily available, and they're going to go for a um, um, air cooled chiller. And once you go for an air cooled chiller, the efficiency drops, and obviously, you, you know, the power consumption goes up, and you you may be up at a 1.4. But that 1.4 really is about as uh, 
about as PUE as most people would expect. Uh, you know, if you can't do better than 1.4, you need to have a look at the design again, I would suggest. But anyway, um, so having given you a little bit of a background in, in terms of the general thing, I'll talk a little bit about electrical. Um, before I uh, flip on the next slide, I'll, I'll say that the electrical cost can be 40% uh, of the project cost. So, um, you know, you've got a building, it might cost you two, three hundred million US dollars. Uh, Forty percent of that is probably going to be electrical. Um, so, you know, how do you put together a scheme with um, high loads and high re reliability? Um, one of the things that's nearly always become a, a requirement is to have two separate grid feeds from the uh, national grid or you know, whatever local grid is from two different substations. Now, it's not always possible to do this, but this is what most people will, you know, would want if they can 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 achieve it locally. I mean, I remember years ago working on trading floors in the UK, and you know, uh, LEB London Electricity Board would not let you have two fat, two separate power feeds in the building because they wanted to kill one power feed if there was any danger or fire, and then know that the the pill, the, the power was off in the building. But here, exactly the opposite is true. They they, you, they don't want to use the uh, power in the building, so they want two supplies. Um, Often because of the size uh, and to try and keep the conductor sizes down, um, they will try and distribute around the building at medium voltage. Um, depending, you know, on the size that, you know, is a typical yeah, rule of thumb. Most data centers are, are you know, below, um, above 30 megawatts would or 30 MVA, because again, with a with a power load, a data center power load, the, the power factor is almost always unity or close to unity. So for uh, megawatts and MVA become almost the same uh, when you're talking about the data side load. When you talk about uh, you know, anything that's getting above about 30 MVA, you're probably going to go to a high voltage power supply. And depending on where you are in the region, um, you know, it will be different voltages. So I won't quote voltages, different countries, different things. but. Quite often, what they do is is come in at high voltage and then drop down through uh, uh, transformers. You have obviously have a supply, uh, local supply authority, um, uh, high voltage switchboard. You might have an owner's uh, high voltage switchboard as well, They're depending on the situation. Then you drop down through a transformer to uh, owner's medium voltage switch gear. And then what I found over the years is what's become more and more uh, common is you will r run things through a series of ring main units. Um, so you run rings of ring main units, uh, loops of ring main units. So um, and what you'll do is you'll have the ring main unit loop, ring main unit loop fed from the two different feeds, but we'll have an open section in it. So where the open section is depends on the design concept. It may be that it's uh, open in the middle of the ring. It may be that it's basically open at the far end of the ring and that you will normally run on one supply and you will only uh, you know, use the other, uh, you know, isolate the other half of the ring and open the, and close the, the ring from the other side in the event of a failure. But that's what typically what you'll do. Uh, ring main units for anyone who doesn't know is normally a main vo a medium voltage thing where you have um, two, you have a, an incoming supply and an outgoing supply, uh, which allows you to form the ring. And then between the incoming and the outgoing supply, you have a tap off, which allows you to feed the load. Um, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide what you have. So typically what you do is you set these things up and um, each ring main unit uh, feeds a block and the block uh, again show you on the next slide will normally be determined between by the a, a generator size because what you're going to do is you're going to say in the event of my mains failing and my losing the um, you know all the power from both sides of the ring uh, I'm going to need to feed that block from a generator and therefore the generator size and the generator is, is going to determine typically what that block is. How many of the blocks that you use will depend on what the what the load is in your you know, data center. So it may be that you uh, consider this uh, uh, as you have, you know, one of these would represent a, um, a ring main unit, represent maybe one data hall, and the data halls may be maybe um, on. Uh, you, you might need, uh, depending on the size and the you know, capacity of the data hall, you might have two on one floor, or you might have one on one floor, or you might have more than one on one floor. So the, really, these are just yeah. This is the sort of the building blocks, and as I said before, this is you know not what one particular company does. This is what I found over you know with variations over you know ten last ten years. Uh, most of the customers that we've been doing have been doing something like this, you know. So um, this will give you basically 
if you look at it as the red and blue as an n plus one um and the the n will depend on you know how many of these ring manias or how many blocks you need to feed your load um and uh, so what i've just said in brackets there is um the n plus one is really only for um you know major plant if a terminal equipment you may have n plus 25 percent so if for example you're talking about cooling units you you would you would not go for n plus one because that wouldn't give you yeah um the the units would be too big to actually work as, as a unit so like that um Obviously, if you go 2N, uh, for, you're rated, this is what I was saying, you're rated for, for tier four or rated four, that suddenly gets very, very expensive. Uh, and this is just generally the scheme that you'd use to support mechanical or, or electrical works. Um, but really, how much and how well you support the mechanical um, systems really normally is a function of the chiller size. The nearly always the blocks that you're using and the chillers that you're using are really going to be a bit big to start on a, a UPS unit, or the UPS is going to be quite a bit, uh, a, quite a sizable UPS to to actually uh, to to restart a chiller. And the other thing is the chillers typically, unless you've got a chiller with magnetic bearings uh, or, or some other modern um, scroll uh, chiller, uh, is going to have a you know a, a fairly substantial restart time. So you know the fact that you um, you know if you're not going to keep it on a UPS system. You're going to have to have a it, pump it down and rebuild it back up, and therefore, you're going to. What most people do is they end up having some form of thermal energy storage, which means basically they make and and support, uh, you know, cool water. They have a tank normally or tanks with uh, with a store a block of cool water in, and that will allow the chillers to run for. Oh, sorry, that will allow the pumps because you can support pumps fairly easily on a UPS. Uh, that allow the pumps to run for you know maybe ten minutes, and that will give you a chance for the generators to start, the uh, the chillers to shake themselves down and get themselves back in working order and, and things like that. That. But anyway, going back onto the next slide on electrical, um, what I described on the last slide of the ring main units, you can see those are at the uh, the bottom of each of these blocks here, um, and you see you know one in, one out, and one spur. And so uh, again, I've used the the red and the blue as uh, to come, to show you that they they may be from opposite ends of the ring. And um, what you then do is you come from the MV uh, ring main unit into the transformer. And, and look, bear in mind these are actually just uh, very very diagrammatic. diagrammatic. Um, you know, if you wanted to go into all the details of how you know, the data centers do these, and you know how the the fact that quite often all of this is automated uh, and not only is it automated it's also metered and you have a, a low voltage system which is actually looking at all of this and you can actually remotely operate from a a keyboard uh, you know, open and close breakers from a keyboard um you know that that's how it works but that, this is really just for simplicity to trying to keep it to a you know, relatively simple and relatively short presentation so basically in and out at mv uh, you know with a, a feed off to a transformer uh, after the transformer into a, a low voltage switchboard and then out of the low voltage switchboard um, you have an ATS an automatic transfer switch to a generator so obviously those two incoming breakers are locked so you'll either have the generator or the feed from the transformer but not both and then you'll have a feed out to a UPS to do the IT load and then maybe a, 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 a non-UPS supported um, uh, load which might be a you know, a mechanical you know uh, system of some sort of a pump or, or or something like that or a fan or or something but it's not something that you're actually uh mission critical so again what you typically do is you'd have the um you know the the red and the blue feed and then what you have there at the bottom is another block and that block it would be a redundant block um so basically you'd say right i've got uh n might be two and the plus one is the redundant block here and that redundant block might be uh one redundant block per hall, or it might be one redundant block, which would serve all the red and blue units. And you know, and this is the difference between basically uh, block redundancy or distributed redundancy. Or, and, and in some cases, you might go for a combination of, of both. And I said, you know, the blocks are typically two and a half, three MVA generator size. The generators would normally, again, depends on what you want and where you are, and whether you're following just, you know, some sort of a uh, specification from you know yeah you know, the client or or whether you know some uh, some other paper that you're trying to follow like uh, uh yeah uptime or or um uh, tia you know the, the the 
but typically the fuel storage is underground tanks for between 24, 24 and 48 hours, sometimes up to 72 hours. But that's when you think of, you know, if you've got a large data center and you've got a lot of generators on there um, uh, and you're running, you know, tanks, underground tanks for, you know, fuel for a lot of big generators, you, you, you know, you end up with a huge you know, tank farm and a huge supply of oil sitting there. And then you end up having a, a potentially having problems with the oil sitting too long with between usage um, and, and so on. And you end up with fuel scrubbing and things like that. But uh, no, this is just a, a general thing. So basically just the load path from the MV through the LV uh, or from the ATS if the, if the power's off to the UPS to the data cabinet. Uh, and a, a similar block might be for uh, mechanical without any UPS. It might just be uh, or maybe only a UPS for the pumps. Um, uh, and the fans, but not the chillers. And um, occasionally we see some of the customers where they don't really want a big centralized UPS. Um, what they'll do is they'll say, right, all my um, servers will have their own inbuilt UPS with them. So their server will be almost like a, a laptop. So it will have its own little battery pack with them. Um, some use this as a little bit of a cheat because what they do there is uh, Obviously, the UPS has some losses. It's you know normally quite a high efficient thing, but it has some losses. And uh, if you worked out of you know saying the the you know the actual uh, PUE of 1.3 or 1.4, some of that PUE is UPS loss. But if you are actually um, supplying a um, server which has got its own built-in UPS, you might be a little bit cheeky and say, well, that is actually uh, only supplying data. But there is actually a little little sort of tricky bit of UPS loss in, in the onboard UPS system, if that is the case. Um, the other thing is typically um, for the generators, there will be a separate feed out to typically a common bus bar where you will have a load bank on the roof. And, you know, you might have a, a feed out from each of these um, LV boards as well. So the idea is that you can actually uh, look and test out uh, you know, the generators every month without taking uh, the data center down. And, and that's what most of the customers end up doing. Um, and because basically um, a lot of this is done in Buzzbar rather than cable, um, you know, Buzzbar will become a significant expense as part of the um, overall project value. Um, they say a picture's worth a, a thousand words so typically uh, what we've got here is in the cabinet at the uh, bottom here typically you'll have a power strip on either side of the cabinet and the power strip will one will be red and one will be blue you know as we said from each of the blocks um, and each of the server units or, or you know bits of IT equipment that the uh, the customer this is what they call dual corded uh, and that means it has two cords and it will feed from red or from blue or red and blue and what it will do is it will sense the power all the time and it will have a, a little um, a STS, uh, static transfer switch in it. And what it will do is it will uh, say, OK, blue's gone down, I'll just change to red. Um, and so basically, if you lose one supply completely, all the cabinets set up there because they, they're all uh, working with these little bits of equipment. They've got two cords on them. Um, one of the issues with this is, is you... you just a, a little bit on the um, the top right there, that sort of gives you a, a little bit of a, a view of, of a, you know, a simplified schematic, which I thought was quite nice. So you basically go from your um, your MV through your HV through your LV um, and then into the data halls with a red and blue power strip down on top of the cabinets. And then you come off the red and blue power strips at each cabinet down to the power strips in the cabinet, uh, like that. But one of the things that's you know, um, people try and get more and more clever with these data centers. So um, they ring the changes instead of having maybe uh, N plus one or, or you know, um, situation, they might come up with a, a, a scheme that they call 3N2 or 4N3, where that means that, you know, N is the number that is three and any two working will be enough or four is the number that you, you need, of which three need to be working. So the little um, uh, three colored uh, UPS block and on the on the right hand side there is actually uh, a um, a three N two um, scheme and it's showing the first server which is taking a feed uh, from uh, blue uh, B and C and the second uh, server is taking it from A and B 
and the third one is taking it from A and C. So um, one of the things that you know you've got to be very very careful, and, and there's been outages you know, in, in buildings caused by this, um, is when you actually load up the servers in each of these cabinets or in each of these rows. Um, how much have you got on each thing? Because if you haven't got the same amount total on A as you have on B, as you have on C, when you actually switch over from one to the other, you can actually overload one. So what can be a real problem is you come up with a scheme which is actually inherently complicated and the poor souls that end up running it um, have got to keep an eye on everything that's switched on. You know, basically when they rack something up, they say, right, OK, I'm adding you know, so many uh, KW to A and B. Uh, OK, well, when was the last time? I, now, does that throw that over the balance now? Because I haven't added another kilowatt to B and C or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's that. And then the other just final thing to before we go off this is uh, that in some cases, these power strips are, uh, well, they're nearly always monitored to you know, work out how many, you know, the, the, how much, con how much they're actually power has been delivered there. Um, quite often to, to bill if it's a customer that's you know selling the space on to bill it to, to their customers um, but it, it, if it's not to, to bill it just to keep an eye on you know the balance of it um, and then in some cases you can have the power the sockets on these power strips like in that cabinet there uh, can be rebooted remotely so you can have a situation where if you've got a server in there and um, the server's gone down and, you know, the the old trick, you know, control, alt, delete, or, you know, hit the, the on off button, the God switch. Um, you can do that, you know, from your office in Miami when the data center is in, in uh, you know, uh, Singapore or, 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 you know, Shanghai, you know, um, if you've got all the right permissions and everything else like that. So what you find is there's a whole subset, and this is, you know, really MVL, uh, uh, touched on HV, HV, MVLV. Um, but there's a whole subset of ELV systems and controls like the, the power management system, yeah, um, which get incredibly complicated, incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly quickly. So um, just moving on a little bit more. Um, when I was talking through the slides with um, uh, Sean, uh, my colleague, he said, what about UPS? <laughs> and he said, static versus rotary. And I go, oh, God, don't go there. Um, uh, it, you know, static versus rotary UPS is it could be a complete separate presentation. Um, in short, the, the, the top two boxes are a, a very simple res, uh, you know, representation of a, a static UPS. Basically, uh, you have the power coming through. It, not quite normal. This is not quite normally how it happens is that, you know, it's showing basically going through as raw mains uh, and then feeding a battery a charger uh, in a battery. What would normally happen is it would actually go through the battery charger. The green line should go through the battery charger and the inverter to the load. It wouldn't normally go through that bypass line. Um, and simply what happens is you, 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 your charger basically turns the, um, or, or, or you have an inverter which turns the AC to DC, then you have a, sorry, a rectifier changes AC to DC, then you have an inverter which inverts it back from DC into AC. And in the event that the power goes off the light, you know, someone digs up the cable in the street, um, basically, your mains pulls the power out of the batteries via the inverter, and you don't get the lights don't go off. Um, if you contrast that with uh, um, a with a, a rotary set, basically a rotary set is a a, um, a great big motor generator block. Um, you uh, under normal situations, the uh, power, the AC power, spins the motor generator up, and it, 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 at the same time as it's spinning it up, you pull off the alternator side of it. Uh, an AC supply which goes to the load, um, but what can happen is you uh, you have some sort of flywheel effect, and you have some other um, various um, magical black boxes which each of the vendors have their own uh, version of. Um, and basically, in the event of a failure, the inertia would carry it through for a certain amount of time. Um, and then what happens is on the same shaft as the motor, uh, uh, the electric motor alternator combination. You have a generator, uh, so you have a diesel engine and you have a clutch. So on as soon as the main failure is sensed, the, you start the diesel engine up. And as soon as the diesel engine has got an, enough uh, momentum to take over, the, the clutch shuts and you then start taking over. The clutch starts running the, the motor generator assembly rather than the AC motor was running it. Um, these can get very, very complicated, very, very quick. And one of the things that really can be a big issue with these is um, um, the way that they're sold and um, the fact that they're, you know, the, these unlikely UPS, uh, uh, static UPS, 
normally a, um, a, a drops or a, a dynamic rotary UPS has a short break and a no break rating. So basically, this might be a uh, you know, 2.5 MVA um, UPS uh, drop set. But what it will have is it will only have maybe uh, a 2.2 or, or maybe even less than 2. Point, maybe even 2 uh, MVA sh uh, no break capacity. And then the rest will have a short break. Uh, and the reason for that is basically what happens is it until the generator, so the diesel engine has taken over running um, the, 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 the motor generator block, it, you're using the inertia to spin it down. And it, the, as the power is pulling um, the, the alternator and taking load off the alternator, it's slowing down, slowing down. And, you know, what you've got to do is if you get if you leave it too long before the um, the, if you've got too much load on it uh, and you're pulling it off too quickly, you'll actually uh, go to an under voltage situation quickly. So you've got to be very careful. The other thing is the rating that they normally sell these at in the catalog. They'll normally sell you these as a 0.8 power factor rating, which is just historical. That's what they used to use. 0.8 was everyone's favorite power factor. If you're using them to supply a data center load, which has a unity power factor or a 0.95, power factor then you need to consider that because you know they will rate this the catalog rating is nearly always at 0.8 power factor and i know situations where a combination of these factors have meant that the these are uh, you know uh people have ended up in court shall we say um the only other thing i just uh talk about is the battery typically five minutes it might be up to 10 minutes now obviously everyone wants to use lithium ion batteries to their mind, batteries bringing with them, obviously, their own fire hazards. I think everyone is very, very aware of that. And they need very, very careful treatment um, in, in, in terms of what you're doing to actually uh, accommodate the batteries uh, and and how you are going to deal with any potential fire, you know, God forbid, should it happen. So uh, I've been speaking probably <laughs> gone on a bit longer than I thought, but I still got a little bit to go. But, it, uh, you know, keep on going, go to mechanical. Um, mechanical, right. OK. This is just a yeah, cut from what Ash Ray would say, where you need to be with uh, uh, in that little recommended zone in the center. Um, and then the A1, A2, A3, A4 are different levels of uh, equipment. Um, you know, A1's enterprise grade equipment and you know, A4 is probably just PCs and lower important equipment. Um, what they're saying is humidity, as long as it's non-condensing, is not really a drama. Uh, and obviously, What's happened over the years is we've started to creep up from it being just a 1820C environment, which was we thought we were keeping everything cool and, and sweet um, and, uh, you know, and also keeping it nice for people to work in. Temperatures are getting up and up and up. Um, obviously, um, this is one of the key sources that, you know, obviously cooling the power. Uh, not much you can do about the power that these processors use, but obviously there's a lot you can do about the cooling. Um, Interesting, if you look at Intel uh, microchip spec sheets for you know uh, processors, what they will say is that the actual performance of the actual uh, GPU uh, uh, graphics processing unit uh, doesn't start to throttle, meaning that they don't start to degrade until the, the chip temperature reaches 80 degrees C, which I found very interesting. And then I just got this thing recently where I, I cut from a website from NVIDIA and they're saying their GeoForce processor uh, graphics cards, basically what which is the normal operating temperature. And they're saying that basically it can run up to 90 C and the maximum operating temperature is 105 C. Um, uh, the card is tested to operate reliable, reliably up to that limit. So you then start thinking, gosh, what are we doing? Why, you know, why are we cooling these as much as we are cooling them? Obviously, you know, we need to have people to go and access the equipment. Um, but, um, you know, clearly, I think we as a as an industry have been overcooling for some time now. Uh, how historically have we done it? Originally, you had the famous crack unit or cry unit, depending on what you want to call it. And they were just basically drawing the warm air back from the uh, computers, circling it through a downflow unit and typically blowing it through uh, a plenum raised floor which was also used as a cabling route. Uh, and basically uh, you pressurize the floor, put the outlets where you needed the load, and then the hot air went back to the cabinet. Um, a little while ago, um, some clever people realized that, you know, the equipment cabinets, they took air in at the front and they, you know, the cool air in at the front and they blew the hot air out the back and they thought, well, oh, 
um, why don't we? And, and believe it or not, it seems so um, logical now that, you know, I, I can remember when people didn't do it, but why don't we actually spin the cabinets around so we have all the inlets facing each other and all the outlets facing each other? So what you then ha have is a situation which is roughly on this uh, on this diagram here where the inlets are all fed with cold air and all the outlets are coming to the, into uh, common hot air discharge. So this was termed hot and cold aisles, um, the aisle being the you know, walkway between the uh, the cabinets. So um, obviously what, when people started getting really sensible about cooling uh, and not wanting to do it, what, what used to happen is some of the cold air that went into the cold aisle was actually went over the back of the cabinet, around the side of the cabinet, and mixed into the hot air in the in in the uh, in the hot aisle. So the air that was actually brought back to the um, um, the crack unit was actually cooler than it ideally should have been, because you you know you had some areas where the equipments were putting out a lot of um, you know doing a lot of work and. Um, and this would have been diluted by spillage of cold air. So you weren't really getting a, uh, an accurate balance between the load that you needed and, and, and you know, the, what, the, what the units were, the, the cooling units were doing. So what people started doing is containing the um, one or the other aisles and the, the term hot aisle or cold aisle containment was derived. So this top figure there is basically uh, aisle containment. I'm not sure whether it's hot aisle or cold aisle. Um, so it probably hot, it's actually hot aisle when I look at it. Um, so, and hot aisle is probably the most common. Um, so, what that means is the the cold air is coming all these grids. You see the three grill. The th oh, sorry, I go back. Uh, the three the, the the series of three floor grills there. Um, that's the cold air coming into the front of the cabinets, and it's on the other side. There's some cold air coming into the other cabinets, and the hot aisle is all going straight out uh, into that chimney, back into the ceiling area, and then it's been directed over the ceiling uh, void back to the uh, the terminal cooling unit where it will get cooled and then sent back out again. So there you get a much better representation because you're not getting any uh, uh, unplanned dilution of the uh, of the air. So basically, you're not just chucking cold air out to do to do uh, to do nothing. Um, so um, more and more as time goes on, this is that top picture is a sort of a halfway house because you've got a, a floor void, a floor plenum, and you've got a ceiling plenum. Uh, as time's gone on now, what people are doing is getting rid of the um, more and more the crack units and they're replacing them by fan walls. So um, what's a fan wall? Basically, it's just a whole series of uh, fans blowing through coils at one end of uh, uh, on one elevation, the elevation that's perpendicular to the aisle. Uh, and they blow cold air down the the cold aisles, basically. Um, yeah. Um, so the problem with this all though becomes um, when you're getting to high cabinet loads um, and I'm talking, you know, anything more than about 20 uh, kilowatts of cabinet, um, you're going to end up moving a huge volume of air. I mean, I once did a, a presentation to DCD in Singapore and uh, I, I had a slide which was showing string vests and people were going like, what, what you got that slide up for? I said, well, yeah, string vests work. They keep you warm in winter in back in the UK because they've got an air pocket in them and they keep you cool in summer because they've got an air pocket in them. And why is that as well? Because air is a pretty good conductor and it's a pretty lousy, a pretty good uh, insulator and a pretty lousy conductor. And yet for years and years and years, we've been using this lousy conductor, a uh, uh, good insulator to take heat away from uh, equipment. And it, it just, to my mind, it, yeah, it's starting to beg a belief. And, uh, and so what we're we're moving on to now is liquid cooling, uh, which I think is going to be uh, more and more the way we see things going. So liquid cooling, you're going to have uh, two slides with the same pictures and the same titles, but the slightly less the words are slightly different. So uh, some sorts of liquid cooling. Um, top one is cold plates. Basically, this little white device there uh, is designed to be like a heat sink. It sits on top of whatever the GPU, the CPU or the memory in the computer is and you run a liquid through it. Um, it could be, uh, you know, uh, some form of um, purified water or it could be some a form of uh, silicon oil or it could be um, a phase change liquid. There's different liquids being used. But the idea is that you liquid cool the chip where the heat is itself. And if you go back to a couple of slides ago where I said that the chip you know, can run happily up to 105 C, 
And if you pump a liquid through that, most places in the world, you probably be able to throw that onto the roof and ditch it into a dry, you know, with with a uh, a dry cooler rather than using a, a, a cooling tower. So, uh, and you won't need any chiller. Um, you know, even in you know most of this part of the world, what I don't know what the yeah average summer design day temperature would be pro probably in most places not much north of 40 C. And if you're you know running water through these, uh, you know, in the 70s at or, or liquid run at 70s or 80s, you should still be able to ditch that uh, through a dry cooler. Obviously, ditching the heat is not the best thing to do with it. It would be much better if we could use it for some sensible purpose. But um, at the moment, you know, I would say the vast majority of uh, data centers out there are using either a cooling tower to reject the heat or they're using some form of other way of rejecting the heat. Um, Occasionally, you'll see someone using it to heat a swimming pool or, you know, heat some houses in Sweden, but it's still nowhere near um, as where it should be, where we should be. Um, the next sort of uh, one is perhaps a little bit more conventional uh, rear door heat exchangers. I, I think this is probably uh, a very useful halfway house at the moment. Um, and here what you have is a big coil on the back of the equipment uh, cabinet. Um, you reject the heat through the equipment cabinet in as you would do before, but this time before it gets blown into the hot aisle, because you, in this case you wouldn't have a hot aisle per se, you would have this big thin uh, coil and you'd run some liquid through that and you would remove the heat from coming off the equipment in that liquid, uh, uh, in that, that, that thin coil in the back. Uh, so this may or may not have fans in it um, and you can use different uh, fluids again. Uh, quite often what you'll do is run a return pair using uh, uh, a cool water rather than a chilled water uh, above the cabinets and drop off to the, to these uh, doors. Um, and um, sometimes you, you you use these to actually provide some in-row in -row cooling as well. So you'll overcool them so that you get some temperature, you know, some temperature modulation and, and in-row, just general cooling as well as just the heat from from these as well. The benefits to my mind of these is you can get uh, you, you don't you're not moving massive quantities of air around uh, as you were and obviously then the fan loads are you end up with the typically the um, pump loads reduced because the delta p over these coils are much less than the delta p over a car or something like that um, and sometimes you might put a, a, a plate and frame exchanger is an interposing uh, frame exchanger between these and the main area so that if you drop the yeah you know, the liquid contents of this you have a limited leak rather than dropping the entire contents of the building um and i see these being used more and more um you can because you don't with the fan wall or the cry units you, you know uh because you you might have extra wide um uh, cold aisles to get the volume of air that you need down them so you, what you can even get is with the in some instances where the volume of air you need to to push down the cold aisle is so high that if you push it down a typical two tile wide, what it used to always be two tile, 1200 wide a cold aisle, um, the velocity past the first few cabinets on, on, the, on the line is such that you get a Venturi effect and you can stall the fans in the equipment on the first few cabinets. So you end up making the, the, you know, the cold aisle wider. Um, as well as that, you'll need some circulation space for round and you need maintenance space. So if you can get rid of all that and you can use the aisle between the two uh, rows of um, equipment and you don't need any hot aisle containment to actually uh, use as a maintenance space for, for um, the rear door heat exchanger, you can actually either uh, narrow down the size of your, uh, you know, your, your data hall or have more capacity in a given size of floor area. Um, these have been used as a retrofit as well. I, I think they're, uh, as you can probably hear from my enthusiasm, that more and more popular. Um, immersion cooling is basically where the equipment sort of turned on its back and, full, uh, and filled up with a non-conducting liquid. Um, I haven't seen these um, being used. Uh, I think everyone still a little bit finds them a little bit novel. Um, there was um, uh, one guy was talking to me about them and saying because they use the oil, uh, you know, quite often use some form of silicon oil in there that the, if you had a fault with it, you'd end up frying your servers, deep frying your servers. Um, I, I think that was a little bit tongue in cheek, but anyway, um, that's that. So just on the cold plates, uh, they're not that popular. Um, the reason why is the guy who's supplying the servers is not the guy who's done the MEP installation. 
uh, and there's some concern that you have to get your tenant or your customer to buy servers that are, can can have these cold plates fitted to them. There are more and more uh, you know companies that will will do that um, now. Um, that company, Cool IT, they will they have got um, Hewlett Packard and Dell servers certified using their um, their chips, uh, their, their you know, cold plates. So uh, and they've done large scale data centers with them. Um, so yeah. The obvious the other thing is um, for years and years, people have been scared about putting any liquids, particularly water, into data halls. Um, so you, you do get a little bit of, uh, not, on, not on my watch, um, but you know um, you get that with pretty much any of these solutions. Uh, rear door heat exchange, as I said, you know, that they, they are gaining some popularity. Um, immersion, never seen them. Um, I say I think I've gone through the benefits of of uh, these liquid cooling systems before. Uh, I realise I'm overrunning a little bit, but I'll I'll speed through um, just very quickly. Uh, some personal um, um, foibles that are quite often, uh, yeah, Uptime Institute Tier Three requires you to uh, the systems concurrently maintain. Sorry, I shouldn't say concurrently maintainable. It, it, it should, yeah, concurrently maintainable. Sorry, not full turn, concurrently maintainable. So some people have interpreted this or they interpret that meaning that for every valve that you have, you should be able to take the valve out without, you know, without downtime. So what they're then saying is you'll need two valves. So um, this this growing trend, which I pull my hair out and fight like tooth and nail, uh, it, where everywhere you have a valve, you put two valves. Um, and I just can't see, I can't understand why People believe that if you've got one valve in a circulation system uh, and it's broken for some reason, that if you had a, another spare valve next to it, that that won't break for some reason. Um, and if you look at, you know, as I did recently, uh, 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 like a 750 uh, mil diameter um, uh, butterfly valve for some uh, a ring main on a roof of a building, um, <clears throat> the mean time between failures measured um, by uh, some uh, Norwegian um, oil experts is 21 years so you think well do we really need to put two of those in anyway that's that um the other thing just on uh, uh hydronics is most of the data centers that we see use ring mains for the distribution um yeah high uh, you know over volume uh low pressure drop ring circuits um and they might have a horizontal and a vertical um so you might depending on where you're um, terminal equipment is you, you have a, typically a horizontal uh, circuit and then you'll have vertical circuits feeding the different floors. Um, and the whole idea of this is you can take a section of the ring main out without uh, to resolve a leak uh, and you've got alternative routes available. Um, another benefit of this means that the, um, the the low pressure drop means that, you know, whichever way you're running, because the the, the majority of the resistance is always in the terminal unit. Um, you know, you're not going to, it's going to tend to self-balance and you're unlikely to have problems with pump, you know, uh, pump performance because, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, all the resistance is going to be in the terminal compared to the the high pressure, uh, the low pressure ring mains. Very quickly on fire, um, fire, most of these uh, um, use pre-action sprinklers. There's just a sprinkler system where you don't fill it with water, you keep it full of um, yeah, you know, the actual range pipe is full of uh, um, uh, compressed air, and what happens is, in the event of two knocks in the fire system being uh, picked up, you'll evacuate the compressed air from the line and allow the line to charge with the sprinkler water. Sprinkler won't go off until the sprinkler bulb is uh, burst by it. You know the the yeah you know, the heating of the bulb, and and you know so you have, you know, you don't get water into the data hall. You will only get water into the data hall if obviously the uh, you get you know, two knocks on the fire, you, you get rid of the compressed air in the system and you fill it with water and a sprinkler goes. Um, most of the uh, data centers used to have data extinguishing systems. They're not as much having extinguishing systems now. They normally just reserve them for the switch rooms. Um, different sorts of gases you can use. And the, the, again, you can either have a, a local bottle store per area or a centralized bottle store. Quite often we're finding that people have a centralized bottle store and they look at the worst case discharge and have allow for two, two worst case discharges through the whole building against a double knock system. Um, and obviously, <laughs> you talked about generators before, there are lots of generators on these jobs. 
Um, you're not really going to do any good with them with a, a gas. You don't really want to um, <clears throat> put through the sprinkler system in there. So quite often the generator enclosures uh, or, or generator rooms are, are fitted with a fine mist sprinkler system and they would use deionized water in uh, um, under pressure in, in, in some sort of pressure store, uh, you know, pressure vessel, and then just uh, put in is a fine mist in the event of a fire. Um, lots of other things you can talk about about the fire services, but that that's uh, that's generally the main thing. Just wanted to talk about cabling types. Uh, obviously, the data center's got huge amounts of cabling. Uh, it used to be uh, unshielded twisted pair Cat six. Uh, now, like to be Cat seven, shielded twisted pair. Um, some performance figures. Typically, what you're saying is you, you, the copper cable is limited to 80, 80 meters. Typically, maybe a little bit more. You might get 100 meters out of it, depending on what you want. But um, most people say 80 is a safe thing. Fiber optic cable, more and more used now. Um, obviously, always in pairs as a transmit receive pair. Uh, multi-mode used within the building um, and then single mode used for campuses and, uh, and you know, uh, longer distances. Um, just as a sort of, uh, you know, talk about some of the architecture, um, the hierarchical system, which is what buildings used to be designed on, which was where you had a, you know, multi-tented building where you started off with an access layer, you went up to an aggregation layer, then you went to core layer. And you had trans, you know, basically the flow of information was really uh, upwards or downwards. So it was basically information being sought from the access layer uh, um, and then uh, taken back out the core layer or, or, or vice versa. But more and more, you're now getting a, a, a spine and leaf arrangement in data centers where you actually consolidated the, um, the, the layers down a bit. And the whole point of the spine and leaf is that you get uh, information transmitted across the data center, uh, you know, east to west rather than north to south, as they call it, much, much quicker. Again, you could run a, a separate, um, whole separate uh, seminar on, on, on these. Um, and then just briefly onto security, realizing that I'm, I'm, I'm over time, um, it's very clearly a, a huge issue. Montreal Authority of Singapore requires any data center where there's a financial transaction to take place um, to do a uh, threats and vulnerabilities risk assessment, which goes through you know, right from, you know, can someone drive a car in with a, um, a bomb in it of a certain number of kg of uh, TNT right through to have you checked who, where you're getting your staff from, et cetera, et cetera. So typically with these data centers, they have a low access, they have it in tiered zones, their perimeters. So you have a low access area, even their low access area is, is probably, um, similar to you'd have in an airport air side. Uh, then you have a medium layer where you, you you basically have more authority and then you have the high level where you, you're into really, um, you know, card in, card out, maybe even, you know, uh, biometric controls, you know, iris controls, something like that. Um, and, you know, everything on CCTV, um, and very intelligent CCTV where you can do all sorts of tricks with uh, setting up um, lines on the CT, you know, pixel lines that people can't cross, people can't loiter. Uh, any movement will, you know, zoom a camera into it. You can link the, you know, uh, cameras to doors, et cetera, et cetera. So more and more and more of uh, ELV systems. And then obviously outside the building, you don't really want people getting in as the first line of defense. So there's nearly always crash barriers um, capable of stopping a car, laser intrusion detection. So they can basically scan the outside uh, of the um, perimeter and they'll, they'll pay, you know, get a, a breach of the security fence within a meter. Uh, you know, CCTV cameras are giving you, you know, uh, very high density uh, images, you know, both day and night, uh, vehicle nameplate, number plate recognition, uh, all, all the you know things, it goes on and on. Um, I would say that they're short of prisons, they're probably the most secure buildings that you'll ever come across. I think this is pretty much coming to, uh, commission, to finishing commissioning. Obviously, uh, as engineers, we, you know, we realize that commissioning is really where the, the rubber hits the road for one of a better series. All of the uh, data centers I've worked on have an independent commissioning authority, and this person is really only there to make sure that the building's commissioned properly. They're not the designer, 
They're not the contractor, they're independent. Typically, they'll use uh, this five-stage process where any equipment um, that's made off-site will be factory acceptance tested. Um, when it comes to site, it will be unpacked and, you know, and checked on site to make sure it hasn't been damaged. Uh, once it's actually been in inspected and, and, and put into service, it will be checked as its single unit. Um, then it will be checked as a part of a subsystem. And then level five will be an integrated system test where all of the systems are tested together. Um, and quite often uh, a, a number of the customers that we work with will use a physical label on every bit of equipment. So they may follow this color scheme and you may actually have go to a piece of equipment um, and say, right, it's got uh, it's got no um, level three green tag on it. We can't power it up. Um, and then it is it, being powered up at level. We had a level three test green tag on it. We've powered it up. Uh, we'll now test it locally. And then, you know, level five will be when we test it as the whole thing together. So um, very, very important. Um, really, that's just the conclusion to what I wanted to talk about today. I hope it's been of some in interest. I, I recognize I've gone on probably a little bit longer than I had intended to. Um, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm, I'm really just from a uh, point of view of a person, you know, working in data centers and seeing data centers and seeing what commonly happens. It's not uh, at all prescriptive uh, um, or recommended or anything like that. It's just really, um, um, you know, I guess what I've seen, I guess. OK. So that's it from me. I don't want to whether want to hand it back to Matt. Are you there, Matt? Yes, question time. All right. So we've got a question from Adnan. Would the 1.4 PUE be dependent on the environment the data center is located? And what would be an acceptable PUE in Australia for an example? Um, good question. No, it doesn't seem to be. Um, uh, the only the only thing I would say is, for example, uh, one, I would say probably 1.4 was probably getting a bit high in Australia because Australia is considered developed and it's you know uh, fairly um, well serviced generally. Um, you know where we would say a 1.4 is maybe somewhere like India where water may be you know, a scarce resource and that that would typically force you to go to a, um, a you know a, a air cooled chiller system rather than a, 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 a yeah, cooling tower system. On the other hand, if you go to somewhere like Norway or Sweden or you know the Nordics generally, where you know you should be able to cool it with fresh air most of the year round, you 1.4 would be pretty low, you know, pretty a pretty poor you know, PUE. You'd hope to get down to you know 1.1, 1.2. Um, quite often, and I think one of the questions that uh, you know people ask is, could you ever get below one, or could you get one as a? I don't think you could ever get below one, or but uh, someone I think. I think actually someone told me that want, went for an interview with one of the big cloud providers and they said, um, could you ever get a, 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 one, a below one? Um, and, I, you know, I think logically would say that, no, you couldn't because, you know, how could you have the um, uh, power feeding the building being less than the power feeding the the, uh, the data center, the data equipment? But um, I'm not sure that that's the case, you see, because what I was wondering was whether you couldn't actually recover the heat and then generate power from the heat. And this brings me back to uh, a, you know, a paper that I read many, many years ago uh, when I was in college, and it was talking about um, solar power. And it, this was saying that there was a, uh, and this is going back many years, there was a solar power uh, scheme put in place in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, and what they did in the solar power thing is they used the solar heated water to actually boil a refrigerant. And then they used the refrigerant, expanded the refrigerant gas, the boiled refrigerant gas through a turbine. And they connected the turbine shaft to a pump and they used that to pump their water through their desalination plant. So my view was that you could just instead of using the solar power to heat the water, you could use the waste heat from the uh computer room and then instead of actually um 
coupling the uh, refrigerant turbine uh, drive to a uh, pump, you could put it onto an alternator. And therefore, you could actually potentially generate power. And therefore, you could actually use some of the waste heat to generate power. And therefore, the you, know, you could get a PUE less than one. Never seen it done. Uh, never seen anyone advertising it, but it was just a, a, a thought I had. I guess it's a sort of a utopia of energy performance that we can aim to target in the future. Yeah, but I couldn't see any, uh, maybe there's someone uh, on the call that can, but I couldn't see any logical flaws in the logic that if if there was indeed this um, uh, desal plant in Saudi that was using solar heated water um, <laughs> to drive a refrigerant turbine, why not? Yeah, so I guess in line with that, I've got a couple of questions. So what measures are being considered or implemented to data centers to achieve net zero? Oh, well, I would say that most of the data center companies that we work with have got a huge um, environmental department that look at pretty much everything that they do. So, um, you know, I think they're well aware of the fact that they're consuming a lot of power uh, and therefore, you know, nearly all of them will uh, will buy power from you know, green sources. They will try and locate near wind farms or hydro or um, so if you look in, you know, somewhere like um, Sweden or Norway, if you can use all your hydro uh, to, to, to is all your power is hydropower, a green power, and then you're doing very little um, cooling and then you're heating the university block next door or something like that, then then you, you, you're somewhat near there. Um, I've seen all sorts of other things, obviously analysis of everything that goes into the data center. Um, there was even a um, recently uh, I was at a, a seminar where there was a um, talk of a data center uh, operator who had thought they'd got down to net zero or very close to net zero you know, by some of the measures I just talked about, and then realized that they ran their generators once a month to test them, and, and that was blowing a hole in it. So what they then were doing was um, using a um, gigapack type of scenario where they got the generator, got rid of the generators, and they put a massive battery pack in place. And that their power reserve wasn't a, um, a generator, and it wasn't a you know an oil fired generator anywhere. It was a you know um, a battery pack. The other thing I think will eventually, um, again, if you look at somewhere like Iceland, where you know power geothermal power is relatively inexpensive, I, I think you you know if you could use hydrogen, uh, and maybe then start to use hydrogen as a fuel for some of these. Uh, systems that that might be a, a, another way forward but you know i think that all the big players have got you know far better brains than than mine um looking at the, looking at this you know so i guess i mean I'll, de I'll derail this a bit but i mean you know you look at tools like green star in australia where they're you know pushing the industry towards electrification and getting rid of diesel generator systems do you see that feasible long term for these type of facilities at a large scale uh, yeah, I you know, I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a, a seed change in in, in uh, battery technology, and I think um, we will see with the likes of people like uh, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, massive developments in battery technology. I think um, you know, I, I think we're already seeing um, massive improvements in solar power, um, uh, and if you look at you know. I think Elon Musk has said that he could power the whole of the United States um, uh, with with solar power in an area somewhat smaller than uh, Utah, you know. And I think he he's actually sketched on maps the amount of space he would need to solar power the whole world. Um, so I think yes, it, you know, it's probably a little bit academic, but I think it will happen. I think um, uh, I don't think I'll see it, but I think uh, you know uh, my kids might. Uh, question from Shunil. How does the Melbourne climate benefit immersion technology? I don't know is the question. So I'm not familiar <laughs> that familiar with it. I the only thing I know about the Melbourne climate is it it was made famous in that crowded house song, Four Seasons in One Day. <laughs> but um no, I, I I don't know. But all I would say is that if you look at liquid cooling and you look at back at I think fundamentally what I was saying about 
I think the great untold story is that processes can take a lot higher temperatures than we've given them credit for. So I think that basically uh, what you could do is probably take liquid from a um, immersion system and put it through some form of uh, direct cooler, dry cooler uh, system. And, and, you know, rather than have, say, um, cooling towers and refrigeration, that, that would be my my guess, but I mean, I'd be happy to hear if it, 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 you know if he's got some first-hand experience of it that he you know is happy to share. I'd be uh... sure. I guess so. I get on from that is another regional question. So, what's the delta T we would want to use for choosing crack units in Perth? And if you're not familiar with Perth, it's quite hot, dry climate. Well, I think what I would say is I probably wouldn't use crack units <laughs> because. I think what I would do is I'd use a, a, a rear door heat exchanger scheme, you know, and then um, I would um, look at what the uh, ambient temperature was and whether I could actually run, depending, you know, what what some uh, operators uh, some operators have done is they have done a situation where they uh, pre-cool uh, they. They use the cooling. They use cooling towers and they use chillers. But what they do is they use the cooling tower to pre-cool the water that they're feeding to the chillers. So they use high-temperature chillers, um, not not low-temperature chillers. So it, yeah, my guess is that yeah, you know, eighteen twenty. Uh, so eighteen twenty is the flow, and maybe uh, you know a, a seven or eight delta T on that. Um, and then um, what they do is they use the, um, the the hot water the um, Say the in-row coolers, um, the the the, the um, rear door plate exchangers, and then they would use that, put put that through a plate exchanger on the cool on the cooling tower system, and then the pre-cooled water that they you know the return water they got that the pre-cooled off a plate exchanger on the cooling towers, they then put into a chiller into a high temperature chiller. But yeah, off the top of my head, as I said, I'm not a design engineer. Uh, I would need to sit down and think about what I would, I would choose for that that part of the world as, as a as a uh, flow and return and temperature but I, I personally wouldn't use cracks uh, I, I I think the the issue with them is that you're going to need space you're going to put you're going to typically use n plus 25 percent units so you're going to have a lot of motors on there you're going to have um, a normally you have a situation where you'd put them both sides of a hall so that if you have a failure on one side you can get it from the other side uh, then you have a situation where you will normally have some sort of plenum to equalize the pressure so that if you have a failure along the length of the row of cracks, you, you can compensate with it. And then you nearly need to always need to have access and more and more nowadays that um, for security and because they don't want a guy with a pair of wrenches into a, uh, um, yeah, into a white space in case he's a you know, Russian spy and he's got a, um, a thumb drive that he's going to try and plug into something. Um, what they'll try and do is that they'll try and keep the the people out so they'll have um, a, a maintenance corridor behind the crack. So it's not unusual. I've seen quite often you have dead space behind the crack is a maintenance corridor, an equalizing pressure uh, plan in front of the cracks, and then you blow into the room and then you have a, a um, space that allows you to get around the ends of the racks to circulate around the end of the racks. So you've really then got three loads of circulation space and the crack space. Whereas if you look at just putting in uh, something like a rear door heat exchanger scheme, you get rid of all that. Uh, so you can have either a much smaller building uh, and you're not blowing a lot of air around because if you've got cracks, uh, you've got to get the air back to the cracks. So you're going to have to have either a, a big plenum or, or, or your, your wide uh, um, cold aisles and all going to go on your, your, your end cost of your building. Having said that, the end cost of your building is probably only going to be 20 percent of the overall cost of the data center. So it's not going to be like, you know, in a hotel or, a, you know, office block where saving, you know, CSA cost is going to be a huge saving to you. It's not going to be the same saving as it would be elsewhere, but it still will be a saving. And it obviously is the green issue of all the materials as well. Fantastic. Um, and last question, does ASHRAE guidelines take precedence over local standards regulating buildings in general in the case of data centres? I would say not. I would say, you know, at the end of the day, you're always going to have to face a guy down at County Hall, aren't you? You know what I mean? Uh, and if you think 
nearly always everywhere you go, you're going to have to get a chop on it and you're going to have to get someone to sign it off to approve use on it. So, um, no, uh, the only thing I've found is that most times if you talk to people in the local authorities and you explain to them what you're doing and where you've got the information from, they'll they'll be OK with it. You know, but, uh, you know, I would never uh, ever condone short circuiting local regulations in any shape or form because they're the guys that are going to end up, you know, certifying it, you know, um, and there may be some foible of that area that, you know, ASHRAE may not be in its infinite wisdom aware of, you know. Awesome. Well, look, that's the end of the question. So I think we'll wrap it up there. But just want to, on behalf of everyone, I just want to really thank you for your time, Chris. It was a fantastic presentation. Very, very informative. Actually, I've got a, someone's raising their hand now. So uh, if you've got a question, please write it down. But otherwise, look, it was really, really awesome, Chris. So I really appreciate it. Well, as I say, you know, it's difficult to, to hit the right level. I hope I've not bored anyone to tears or, or, or you know, in any way, uh, you know, uh, miss something that someone would have been uh, like to have known. But anyway, um, you probably know that I love the business and um, it's a pleasure if you can to, you know, uh, to share some of your experience with other people. It's something I think that as engineers, we should be doing uh, as a matter of course, you know. Awesome. Well, I guess for everyone online, um, this is being recorded, so this will get distributed via the SIPSI website, I think, within a month. Um, but if you have any questions, send them through to SIPSI and we'll pass them on to you, Chris, and maybe we can intro people online and, and they yeah. can contact you directly if they want to discuss further. Yeah. Okay. Thanks awesome. very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks Bye very now. much, Bye. everyone. Have a good night.